Michael McMillan, is this your fantasy garage? Is this garage a representation of a garage you once knew as a kid? Well, it's, it's kind of an archetypal. It's really not a garage. It's, it's an illusion of a garage. But it's kind of based on, on a lot of places I, I had visited when I was younger. And um, the actual genesis of the piece um, years ago, in 1981, Stephanie Barron asked me to, to participate in an exhibition at the Los Angeles County Art Museum called The Museum is Sight, 16 Installations. And for my part of the exhibition, I wanted to do a portrait of Los Angeles, and so I thought about what perfect metaphor as the car to symbolize this kind of automotive-driven city. And then I was thinking about cars and where you keep them, and, and I was making a, a parallel between the American garage and uh, the Egyptian tomb of the pharaohs. And hold on a second. The, um, the comparison was um, in the Egyptian tombs that they buried the pharaoh in all his possessions for his afterlife. And the metaphor was, in America, it would be retirement and your leisure years. So we have this kind of strange kind of parallel analogy between Egyptian architecture and the American garage. So in this case, I have the, the car elevated to the status of the kind of funereal barge on this elevated platform with these kind of mystical sayings alluding to some kind of um, spiritual um, future. And the fireplace in the back seat of the car, what does that represent? Well, um, a lot of things are better left unexplained so that the viewer can freely associate. I mean, what it means to me is one thing, but it, I don't often like to, I often don't like to lock things down too specifically because I think the people, the whole essence of the work is to have people interact and form their own associations with it. So some of these things are provocative kind of starting points for people to work through their imagination. So in other words, when you start a piece such as this, the Central mm -hmm. Meridian, or another piece that would be similar, you don't have a scenario before you start. It just sort of happens? It really grows. The starting point is obviously the concept, the idea. But from that point onward, the piece really evolves and grows as I do it. It's, a, it's still growing. It's a work in progress. It doesn't have a finished date yet. Because I'm always adding to it and changing things and bringing new things into the space. So in that sense, it's a big three-dimensional walk-in assemblage where you kind of, by entering into this piece, you um, become part of it. It takes you out of the museum setting and out of the current era very quickly and transports the viewer to another time and place of their choosing. It's really an, an open-ended narrative where the viewer kind of finishes the story based on their own history. And in that sense, um, the viewer is a very active part of the our experience. And also, I wanted to make a piece that would um, engage as many people as possible, from little children to mature adults. Uh, I've had tours of, of kindergartens come through here and, and come away with a very authentic experience. Well, the kids must love this Oh, yeah. Place. It, oh. It, it's very spooky to them. <laughs> and they, it doesn't frighten them? Some yeah, a little frightened, but eventually their their curiosity wins out, and they go in anyway. Uh -huh. And they feel very, they feel very empowered once they come out of here. They feel like they've really done something. And the, the objects are they found objects? Did you make them specifically? Uh, Ninety percent of the objects are things that I found in and around Los Angeles. Uh, the things I've fabricated, I've tried to make them to where you can't tell that they were new objects that have that, been treated in ways that, to make them look very convincing. So it's a combination of, of, of found and fabricated objects. Do people that come through add little things to the displays and then you find them at a later date? Or are they pretty good about not stealing or leaving? Yeah, generally people are, are pretty gentle with it. There's always the exception, but generally they, they tend to 
to leave things. It, this piece is unusual in, in most museums in that uh, there are no guards in here and you're free to touch things. So you're kind of on your own, which is part of my original intent of making the viewer an active participant in, in the experience. So um, most people leave something, a little token, a little business card, something. I'll often find items relocated in this space. And so every so often I'll come through, and if it looks too out of character, I'll move it back to some other more appropriate place. Michael, it's very crowded in here with a lot of stuff. Yes. How in the world would you notice if something was stolen? I probably wouldn't. <laughs> it's, it's, this piece kind of, um, it's dependent upon the cumulative effect of all the visuals for its overall impression on the viewer. So, if a small thing gets nicked, you know, it's replaceable, generally. Um, I don't know, it's pretty hard to find flexible flyers. Yeah, well that's, sleds are that's, very that's true. It's funny, when I built this piece originally, a lot of these things were just junk, and now they're called antiques. <laughs> <laughs> the initial experience of coming here, you feel like you've, you're almost, you shouldn't be here. It's almost like a for, for, forbidden kind of a voyeuristic kind of experience. Yeah, like the guy's just left. He's gonna come back and yell, "Hey, kids, get out of here!" You know. <laughs> so in that sense, it it there's kind of an edginess it, it has that kind of um, you don't know it 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 it, it forces the viewer to kind of um, a little bit pushy to go in. Like, do we go through these doors? Can we touch it? We don't know. But if you do, you're rewarded by going in further and further into the piece. What is the Temple of Cosmic United Atoms Revealed? That is, I wanted to give, um, like I said, I, I was trying to create a persona of a person that, that would have worked in this space. And so to that end, I wanted to give him a little bit of character, or, or I wanted to give hints to the viewer as to who this person might be. So aside from the scientific apparatus and the books and, and the tools, um, I wanted to give him a, 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 quote, spiritual side, but not just your average spiritual side. This is kind of a, a backyard, homemade, home-baked religion. So I, I've always liked the idea of kind of folk art and visionaries. And so I, I made this, this little sign to kind of imply there was this kind of organization that he was somehow involved with. And so that's the, the temple of cosmic united atoms revealed. So it's a little kind of brain teaser, basically. Do many of the objects in the Central Meridian have stories that you know, that you're aware of? A lot of them do. Uh, things, that obviously, that I find in, in trash, I don't know where they came from. But there are some objects that have stories behind them. Um, yeah, there's old civil defense helmets and license plates from California. Um, things just gathered from Douglas Aircraft Company that's no longer extant. There's a lot of um, a lot of 20th century history here. Yeah. It's basically it's time capsule and there's or time machine. The car there's Chucky the clown. Yeah, that's actually a, a Jerry Mahoney doll. Oh. That that okay. someone gave to me. Um, it was Hugh Downs' daughter, Dee Dee Downs, gave it to me. It was her little. Um, a Jerry Mahoney doll. And the funny connection is that my dad knew uh, Paul Winchell because Paul used to have a TV show, uh, the, the Winchell Mahoney Club, the Jerry Mahoney sh Club. And my dad used to work on these shows doing the sets and so that's how they knew each other. So you never know how these funny unrelated things can reconnect. And what I like about this piece is, it, is the collage aspect. It's just there's all these thousands of histories kind of brought together for this one event. And then you come in here and everyone has a, a different experience of the thing. I have a lot of favorite pieces that you have done. And one of them was a piece which was called the Traveling Mystery Museum. Ah, yes. That was my first um, big work, I consider, uh, installation work, done in 1973. For Leica. Um, actually, it was done as my graduate exhibition at UCLA, my oh. MFA show, yeah. I didn't want to show in a gallery, so I, I rented a storefront down in Venice and, and built 
what appeared to be this kind of itinerant roadside museum. I, I had signs and it cost a quarter to get into it and you could look at these different displays. And the mystery mummy was the, the featured exhibit. That's what I was going to say. I seem to remember a mystery mummy. Yeah, I had this, this, this mummy in this case made out of old glass doors and the mummy was laying on a chaise lounge. And it was, it was a real mummy. It was wearing uh, faded uh, Madras Bermuda shorts and a Hawaiian shirt. And uh, on this panel next to the case was a series of photographs taken out in the California desert where it was discovered, like an archaeological site. And there's, there was like coins from the pocket of the mummy and the wallet and, and these sandblasted Italian sunglasses. It was all there, and, and, and there was the mummy in, in the case. And so there were all these different uh, displays of items of these kind of fantastical events. There was a secret invasion of the Oregon coast. There was a food that spies on you. The world's most dangerous chair. The clock of doom. Uh, giant Hollywood insects. All kinds of strange, bizarre displays. And also a little souvenir stand. And if, if, if you looked very closely, the more you looked at it, the more you realized that what you looked at wasn't what you think you were seeing. So the piece really revealed itself again. By looking at it very closely, you, you, it was revealing itself as something other than what you thought it was. So it was about observation and illusion. Yeah. Michael, how do you store a mummy? Well, besides carefully? In parts, in boxes, because the mummy actually I built. Uh, yeah, I built the thing. Okay. So um, I have it in boxes. I wish I hadn't heard that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. So that was that was kind of my, one of my early installation pieces. How many installations all told have you made? Oh God, I've forgotten. I'd have to total maybe a 15 or 16. I'd have to total it up. I have I have stacks of plans for things that haven't been built yet. Just wait, waiting for opportunities. Yeah. Um, another favorite was, and I don't remember the title of this one, but it was the Airstream trailer in the desert with the, you know, the, oh. the background of, of the lights. Uh huh. That piece is called Aristotle's Cage, and it's um, at the Oakland Museum, on on display there. And that piece, uh, in the foreground, you, you come into this dark room, and there's a large triangular table. This is how it was initially. And at the apex of the trailer, the part close to you, was this miniature, like a trailer that might have been built maybe in the 40s or 50s. The lights are on, it's nighttime, and it's, you're in the desert. And out in the land behind the trailer, there's like an acres of junk, like old car bodies and oil drums and appliances and refrigerators and boxes and piping and stacks of wood, and all kind of going off towards the distance. And at the horizon, you can see that the hills undulating behind them is like a the red glow. Could be dawn or something, but it's, it, there's a little red glow behind the hills. And there's like a, some kind of industrial complex on the horizon. And um, out of the trailer come the sounds, strange sounds of telemetry, like people talking and strange radio transmissions. And in the sky over this tableau, there are these skeletal forms of a, of a um, human being chased by a canine. And that's called Aristotle's cage. 